Peace. How you doing, brother? I'm good. How's everything? Man, we're trying to survive out here, you know. Um, we already begun the recording because I, I knew that uh, you'd be calling in, you know. Okay. But, um, you know, we ready to rock. If you ready to rock. Okay. Okay. So, um, first and foremost, welcome to Riot Starter TV. Usually we do this uh, live program um, and we, we usually bring on different OGs. Uh, we have okay. different different folks who, you know, been involved in movement and struggle and also uh, folks who are a legendary in status that, um, you know, we're, we're, whereas uh, their story isn't often told amongst the masses. So we like to bring on folks to uh, to lay it down. First and foremost, how are you feeling today? I'm good, my brother, considering everything's cool. Okay. Like they say, we don't complain, we campaign. No doubt, no doubt. That's the movement. That's the movement. Um, yeah, man, definitely honored to have you on because of the fact that we've been hearing a lot about you for uh, for years and, and decades, literally. You know, so, um, you know, always wanted to, uh, you know, chat it up. So I'm uh, definitely happy to have the opportunity to get on with you. Um, pleasure and honor is mine, bro. No doubt. For folks who are unfamiliar with you, I want to kind of uh, give a... Uh, a brief bio, but I think it would only be right if it comes from you opposed to, you know, me freestyling based off of my limited knowledge. To <laughs> <laughs> right. um, give a brief bio of myself? Um, yes, sir. Kind of. I was born in. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was born in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, at a young age, I was a precocious reader. I started reading at maybe about four or five years old. And I had the, uh, back in the, all the way back in the days, when drug addicts used to be your artists and your... Let's call it from a federal prison. The Mexicans, there was a host of drug addicts that used to be in my house because my family was involved with in drugs. Mm -hmm. But they used to talk with me. And they start, they saw that I had a pretty good memory and they started teaching me how to recite. They introduced me to Poe and Shakespeare and Kipling and uh, a host of other writers and they had me recite them to them. And then they introduced me to a uh, reading and I started reading, I started off reading mythology and I moved on by the time I was 11 or 12, it was giving me a lot of black literature. When I was a real young kid, I read, uh, read uh, Sex and Race by J.A. Rogers mm. and 100 major, 101 major facts about the Negro by J.A. Rogers. Then I read from Superman to Man mm -hmm. by the time I was about 12. Okay. Uh, and afterwards, I uh, drifted into the nation of Islam and I remained there for a while. Uh, like I said, I came in a drug infested environment, so I was already introduced to the streets and eventually I found my way, my way there. Word, word. And I guess as they say, the rest is history. No doubt, no doubt. So you started off as, uh, you know, for the listeners, uh, the viewers, I was advised by, reminded by our producer that um, I didn't even say who you were. You know what I mean? Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, I do that every now and then. You know what I mean? But um, it's all good. For, for those of y'all that don't recognize the voice, this is Wayne Akbar Prey um, out of Newark, New Jersey. Uh, many of you know him as a quote-unquote street legend. And today we want to uh, talk to the man, the myth, the legend, not only about how he came up, but uh, where he's at right now and his foundation and what he's looking to do from where he's at right now. So um, you, you mentioned that you, you came in, uh, came into this life in a drug infested community. You know, give us a little background on that. I know that you said that, uh, you know, you were around a lot of folks, but I've heard on previous interviews that you actually come from a family of folks who were involved in that particular uh, uh, endeavor, so to speak. From the time I came into the world, my brother, they were selling drugs out of my house. Mm -hmm. When I was a little boy, four or five years old, and the police used to kick the door and so often, they started keeping the stash in my pajamas. Wow. So I was five, they would wake me up in the middle of the night and say, uh, Wayne, hand me three bags, or two bags. I'm asleep. Right. I'd wake, I'd wake up, get them three bags to try to get ready for school tomorrow. But that would take place intimately off and on for during the night. At mm -hmm. about 11 or 12, Maybe 13, my brother got strung out. I have a brother, his name was uh, Omar. Okay. He got strung out at 12 years old, he had tracks. When he used to go to the youth house, when the kids was running up and down and playing uh, ping pong and boxing, he was going through withdrawals. Mm. Uh, my sister, Angie, 
was actually my first cousin. We were raised as brothers and sisters. Ultimately, she fell to victim to a hair bomb because, like I said, this was the world that we knew. Right. You know, when this is the only world that you knew, you don't even know that there's another world. That's right. That's right. My sister started getting off in her neck, and after a while, she was strung out. All of the children in my age, with the exception of me, that came up became drug addicts. Now, you talk about this, what what years? Because folks, you know, they have this, uh, it's this myth that, that, you know, drugs came on the scene in the 70s and 80s, but it, it sounds like you're talking about a little earlier than that. Is that right? No, but this was in the 50s. It was in the 50s. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this was in the early 50s. The uh, difference then is that the, a lot of people were drug addicts, but you didn't have many dope veins. You know? mm. Uh, a lot of them were like artists, they were musicians, you know, the, uh, I'm not naming names to say this, but tell the caliber. Yeah. The John Cole train, it's called, it's from a federal prison. These were the kind of people that used drugs back in that time, your poets, you know, your actors and actresses. So I got the benefit of being around them and they introduced me to literature at a young age because a lot of them were very literary. Mm. They introduced me, to, that was the upside. The downside was naturally the exposure. Wow. Wow. So you, you come from this environment, you talk about the fifties, uh, you literally being raised in, in, uh, raised in, 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 in the dope game for lack of better words, you know, coming into it during that era. Um, what, uh, you know, how did, how did you get involved in the whole hustle side of it? Because of the fact that it's one thing to be around folks who are users and, and, and distributors, so on and so forth. But, but what, you know, at what age did you decide that, you know, or how did it come about? Maybe you didn't decide it. Uh, you know, a lot of people gravitate to it. I was, this was the environment I was born in. Right. You know? Right. And that's not to make them, and this is not to offer an excuse, but it's to offer an explanation. Yes. You know? But, uh, when, when this is the only world that you know, and this is what you see in the world, then this is where you come up at with your heroes and the people that you grow to admire. Or did you seek to emulate, or either hustlers, pimps, or in some, if you was a woman prostitute, then this is who you identify success with. I identified success with people that were successful in the drug business. By the time I was 14 or 15 years old, I was selling a little marijuana on the side. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was making, my mother showed me her check one day, I was a young boy. And it was for $49.70 she had worked all week. And I had made that one day selling reefer. Right. And although I had basically skipped through school, I decided that school was over. I was getting ready to graduate, I guess the next, that year or the next year I was 15, I was graduating early. And I gravitated into the uh, into that world. I was at some advantages because I knew it. And I was uh, had some other advantages because I was I had a certain amount of innate intelligence. Right. So I uh, blew up fast. Right, right, right. So, I mean, you know, man, coming from the East Coast, like I said, uh, like I told you before, uh, I had family. I would spend summers in um, in Elizabeth and, and Newark and, and, and so on and so forth. And I remembered even back then, uh, your name was, was, was known, you know, not just in, in, in Newark and in Jersey, but just in, in various parts of the East Coast. You know, so it, it, it seems almost like a um, for folks who are unfamiliar with, with with street life, period, just the fact that you like you said, you grew up in that particular environment, but then you graduated for a lack of better words to what would be considered uh, kingpin status. And I use that in air quotes because of the fact that that's just how it's been described. I mean, you know, how does th this young boy, you know, just become this? You know what I'm saying? Like you said, this environment made you, but, but you know, make it plain for folks you know, again. You, what you do in, in my particular case, you just set out to live. And although your goals now in retrospect might seem uh, short-sighted and limited, those was the goals from the environment that you, they, they said that uh, geography is off of destiny. Right. Those, those was the goals that was tied to the world that I lived in. Yes. And if I was if I was going to live in it, I was going to try and thrive, and I certainly wasn't going to be a drug addict. Right. So if I had to choose between being a drug addict and a drug seller, I would end up being a drug seller. Yes. Yes. And uh, just doing the course of it, just you know, 
We're listening to uh, Wayne Akbar Prey. Uh, he's calling us from uh, uh, federal penitentiary. So, you know, bear with us. Of course, the phone is going to co come in and out because we're doing this in, in 10 minute spurts. Um, one of the things he's talking about for those of you who are checking us out uh, late, basically speaking on his, um, his, his growing up in a quote unquote drug culture in, in, in street life. Um, and we, we're not, we don't have them on here to um, celebrate the culture, but to, to point out the, the, the lineage and the long history as to how this thing comes about, because often, so often folks hear about these cases and different individuals who are out in the streets and who end up getting, getting uh, you know, imprisoned. And we also we always have these 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 judgments with lack of understanding. So I wanted to bring the uh, brother on because of the fact that I know that he's on a, on a different path right now. And he's certainly working towards uh, guiding others in the, in, the, in the right direction. You're checking out Riot Starter TV. This is a live broadcast. And, um, you know, we're on Black Power Media. Make sure you you stay tuned with us and continue to check us out. Uh, we have the morning show, which is the remix morning show, which broadcasts every Tuesday through Thursday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. And uh, we have a host of dope folks on it, various topics, you know, dealing with news and social commentary, so on and so forth. Um, of course, we also have Renegade Culture, which is the other show that I co-host and, you know, say a revolutionary show that airs once a week. But here at Riot Starter TV, like I mentioned earlier, I want to kind of bring on folks who you won't find anywhere else or bring on stories and information that you won't necessarily find in the quote unquote books. You know, so uh, this is one of a series of pieces that we'll be pushing number of number of different lines because of the fact that we want to in, in our efforts to politicize our viewers and to to bring a a broader scope to the to the to the uh to the scene one of the things we want to do is definitely uh you know break it down you know how do we get here why do we exist in this era you know why do we exist in this particular arena you know who put this you know the plantation poison out there you know what i mean so that that's what it's all about again checking out riot started tv we're gonna go to a quick break and we're gonna come right back at you Peace. I was saying that I got cut. I was saying that I got cut off mid sentence. Okay. But what I wanted to what I wanted to add to you know where some of us ultimately end up at is you know so it's sort of like fashion when to say that we all have choices, and that's true to a general extent. But to a to a realistic extent, it's less true for us than it is for many others. Right. You know when if Aaron decides that she wants to be a dancer. Mother has the wherewithal of a center to ballet school, and if she's not still not doing good, hire uh, an instructor. At the same breath, if uh, Rashida decides that she wants to be a dancer, they don't have the financial wherewithal to allow for that. Right. So Rashida has limited options. Cameron has multiple choices. Right on. Right on. Yeah. And same true, like I said, uh, with Bilal as opposed to Robert. You know, Bilal is good with math. His income opportunities is probably with the number writer, you know? 
Right. Uh, but uh, Brantley is also good with math. And when he slows down, his mother's going to bring in an instructor. That's right. So Brantley does have multiple choices. He can be uh, multiple choices. He can be basically anything he wants to be. But Lau has limited options. So when you do see Bilal subscribe, in spite of the rip... This call is from a federal prison. When you see Bilal thrive, in spite of the rip ties of racism, more often than not, we're anomalies. But those that do really should be held up because they have survived the thing that's set in line for them to fail. There's no multiple choices. You know, like I said, there's limited options. And as they often say, geography is off the destiny. I know in many regards it was with me. I hope I addressed what you, we were talking about before we got disconnected. No, absolutely. You absolutely did. And I, I wanted to say, um, wanted to ask on that same token, who would you say the limited options are, have been provided by? Because of the fact that everything, you know, exists for a reason and we know we're not in a bubble. You know, where, where did those limited options come from? Did they fall out the sky? Was it provided by another force? What was the situation? You know, it's environmental, you know, it's, um, you know, it's environmental. They said that uh, necessity is the mother of invention, you know. Right. So when you have the bad necessities, when the uh, department stores and all of that move from the inner city out to the suburbs, the only employment really, as I was coming up, was generally the number man. They right. had basically two businesses, if you were well off a black. You had a funeral parlor or you had a restaurant. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that there wasn't any other lines of employment. I was just telling you, essentially, you know, what made the difference in the inner city communities at that time. Now it's changed. This is 2021, you know. And the situation in some regards is not as dire, but in other regards, they're more dire. Right. Okay, okay. So, you know, moving right along, you know, from that point, you ended up um, uh, catching a case uh what was that 1989, 1980, 1988. 1988. Okay. So you catch this situation. Um, and ultimately you sentenced to, uh, how much time? Life plus 50 years. Life plus 50. Okay. Yeah. At this time you, you were like, how old were you? You getting life plus 50. What, what? I, I had just turned 40. Just turned 40 years old. Wow. That was 33 years ago. Wow. Wow. So you've been down 33 years. Man. 33 years. Man, so a- almost half your life. Almost within two or three years of being half my life. Right. That's 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 wild. Okay, so, um, man, so so you catch this time is it's life plus fifty. Um, what what uh, I mean, how does that hit you? I mean, like, what what do you do from there? I mean, I know that you know conditions and everything, like you said, atmosphere, and, well, you know. I'm not number one. Though. I always believe ultimately I'll prevail. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take to prevail. Right. But I, I've never, I've lacked a lot of things, but it's never been self confidence. That's right. And I'm not a stressor, you know. Yeah. So these are 33 years, have been 33 years of constant fighting, you know, trying to change the uh, trajectory that they placed me on. Right. On. The people that I was involved in in the case, the uh, Connect the Plugs, they have been out for over two decades, all of them. Wow. I'm the only one that remains in my case. The main connect did eight years, her husband did 12. The pilot didn't do a day. And wow. uh, they gave me life plus 50. And I dared to try and live outside the cast. Why, why, why would you say they hit you with so much time and and, and these folks you're talking well, eight, 12 number years? one, they cooperated in the case. They was involved in the case that had nothing to do with me. Mm. Uh, and they, in that case, they cooperated, but their cooperation was limited. I had been a, the one of the Columbia girls had been my woman, mm. but I hadn't seen her for over a year. She had run away. I hadn't seen her in a year. After a year of being in jail, the feds came to her and offered a, a, a further reduction in time if she could bring in somebody else. And she talked about some activity that me and her had did a couple of years back at that time. Wow. So, so ultimately. Yeah. Ultimately, you were charged with what? I was charged with uh, 848B, the super king, the 848 AMD. Mm-hmm. The regular king pen statue carried from 10 to life. The super king pen statue, at that time, they had only had uh, two or three in the country that uh, was charged under that statue. It was me 
me and the Torres brothers, Victor and George, who they just recently went home, thank God. But we were the only ones charged in that regard. And the under the 848B under the Super King, Kingpin, the only sentence you can get is life. What they call the pen ultimate sentence. Right. That's 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 that must have been a uh, a, a hell of a um, <laughs> compliment for a lack yeah. of better words. Yeah. 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 So so man so um I mean I, and and I'm asking these questions because of the fact that part of the reason I wanted to have you on is because of the fact that um you became an author um while while yeah. while while locked down and the name of the book uh it's called the game, the game is, dead. is dead right on right on. yeah S speak to that because of the fact that there's a lot of youth out here right now and 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 the climate has changed this call is from a federal prison yeah. well this if, if i had to speak to the brother this is what i would tell him to, to the youngsters out there that stand on the the periphery you know on the cusp of jumping into it first thing if you can't trust the people that you are uh, selling to and you dare not trust the person that you are buying from, then you haven't entered into a game, you've entered into a trap. Right. You know, uh, rose-colored, uh, rose-scented, for the trap. What you should know is that at some point, your main man, your dog, your road dog, whatever you want to call him, will be answered, asked the question that he can't refuse and given the proposition that he won't refuse. And with speed, the void of conscious, brother, he's going to throw you up under the bus. Hmm. Might not be now, it might be later. What you should also know is that everybody you know, you know contextually. You know, change the concept and you change the person. Change the context and you change the person. The person that you can trust around your woman, you dare not trust around money. Hmm. And you see $2 above lunch money, you'll put two in the back of your head. None of you, your woman can stand around him butt naked and he won't, you know, he won't offend you or your relationship. Hmm. So you know him contextually. What you don't want to behave once you get into a court of law and the guy comes in there with the high water pants and the American flag in his lapel. Hmm. Then, the, you know, then the brother that was a high, you know, high no gunslinger he becomes a government informant or becomes, a, even if he's not a government informant, the police testify. That's, 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 so that that's the lay of the land, bro. That what you said is, is is very necessary. I know that um, you know, maybe about a year or so ago, they had this rapper out here, uh, Takashi Six Nine, and one of the things he did was um, uh, I mean, he's running around wilding, and then uh, you know, as soon as he got popped, you know, he decided to turn state, and he got out within a year or some change. Um, and, up, can you stay in the rain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we 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 see these characters, and as soon as he get out, he's embraced by many of the youth today. We're talking to Wayne Akbar Prey. Um, again, he's uh currently locked down for life plus fifty five. He's talking about uh, we're talking about everything from his journey as a uh as a youngster coming into uh, the whole dope game by default and then him being raised in it and and in turn ending up uh incarcerated doing life plus 55 you know so we're gonna come right back we're going in and out because of the fact that he's currently locked up in federal prison and um you know you're checking out riot starter tv we're gonna get into a few more things or whatever about uh you know, this whole, everything from the the uh, street culture to the snitch culture to bringing it back around and, um, you know, being on the right side of history. You're checking out Riot Starter TV on Black Power Media. Get familiar.
Here we go now. Uh, to my young brothers out here, this is what I would tell you. And under no set of circumstances does the risk outweigh the reward. You don't have to take my word for it. Ask Big Meeks down there. Ask Rudy Williams. Ask Pete Roloff. Ask Pete Monsano. Ask Big E. Eric Bozeman. All of these brothers were sentenced to life with no parole. Fake, you know, a twist of fate allowed them to finally get out. Most of them after spending about 25 years. But under no set of circumstances, any way you look at it, was it worth what ended up ultimately ended up happening? That's that's all I'll say to that man. Word, word. Step back from the track. No doubt, no doubt. Definitely appreciate that. Um, right now, you have a. Uh, a book that that has gotten rave reviews. I know throughout the years, you know, you've been featured in everything from Don Diva to a number of different uh, uh, street magazines, uh, newspapers, documentaries, so on and so forth. Um, your book, let's talk about that. You know, I know you brushed on it a little bit. What what's the the, the premise behind it? You know, when I was in Lewisburg, when I first got there, I kept on seeing young black and Hispanics of color coming to uh to the prison in droves. Some of them had life with no parole. Some of them was barely old enough to shave, man. 18 and 19 years old. They didn't even have any idea what they was there for. And I felt compelled, man, to address the issue of the game, what it was, what it used to be, and what it no longer is. At first, I did it with them. And then after a while, uh, people started talking. This call is from a federal prison. I decided to broaden my platform and to speak about it generally. Um, I lost a son to it. You know, I had a son, he was 19 years old. You know, he was killed in a drive-by shooting. Mm. But, you know, an innocent victim of a drive-by shooting, but that's the nature of the beast in the game. So I wanted to speak up, out, and against it. You know, and the born guys, you know, to be weary, you know. To take this serious because there ain't no stage joke. Mm. That was the basic premise. My, I want my life to be a cautionary tale. So that we wouldn't end up having this discussion that we have it now with me and you walking around the yard. No doubt, no doubt. Then definitely, uh, you know, of course, time is valuable, and definitely appreciate you, you know, uh, giving us the opportunity to rap with you. You know, you have a uh, an organization that you've been pushing. Um, Akbar pray for. I'm, I'm yeah. Akbar pray foundation for change. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, what we did, what we started. To some of the guys that came out that put the street life behind them, I was sending them into some of the high schools, more particularly my alumni Central High School in Newark, and dealing with some of the at-risk inner city kids, you know, that had it twisted. You know, they thought that this is what was really was popping, was being in the street and busting your gun. So I had one brother come up in there. I had some uh, forensic doctors come in and talk with the kids. And while they was talking, the whole time that the forensic doctors was talking, the kids was texting and laughing. Hmm. I had a brother named Muhammad from Newark. He came to the front of the class and he took off his jacket. The kids were looking. After he took off his jacket, he took off his shirt. After he took off his shirt, he took off his t-shirt. He had nine bullet holes in his body. Hmm. He said, this is what the street is hitting for. They listened with bated breath. You could hear rap piss on cotton. Hmm. Because I was talking to them in their language. Right on. And this is what we've been doing routinely. We've been sending out guys that have had the street behind them. We went out to the boys' clubs and we created a Socratic circle where we had maybe seven or eight guys and 20 or 30 of young kids, young uh, black kids, young black and Hispanic kids. And we sat down and we talked about the streets and we talked about the law and we talked about criminal justice, you know. And, uh, you know, we I think we changed a lot of lives. I did Q&As at some of the high schools, you know, took questions and answers, you did call-ins. Mm. That was the nature of, uh, that is the nature of the ATFFC. And also talking about empowerment, you know, telling them try, to try and learn 21st century. You don't need uh, 20th century job skills in the 21st century. So we talked about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And asked them, telling the kids, put, pushing them in that direction. My writings became part of the curriculum, so we opened up a lot of the, uh, the classes opened up with, uh, Last of a Dying Breed of Death of the Great Game. Mm -hmm. And then we had a discussion built around that because it was applicable to them. Now, we could broaden the discussion from that base, but it was something that caught their attention. Right they on. understood Omar, you know, the, uh, central character.
to the uh, last of a dying breed. They could relate to them. Mm-hmm. Man, so what? Uh, man, that that's 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 powerful. What compelled you to 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 do this? I mean, you know. I mean, for for the listeners and the viewers, you know, some folks would be like, well, you know, uh, is he just doing this because he locked up? Is he just, you know, I mean, you know, the naysayers, what would you say? For me, brother, this is messianic, man. You know, this is this is my core mission for me now. You know, I don't have any other interest in doing it. I started doing this before compassionate release was even a consideration before the uh, two-step. I don't have a crack cocaine case, so the 100 to 1 or... 18 to 1 did impact me. Yeah. What impacted me was after I wrote a book, I got a letter from a little kid out somewhere out of Virginia. And he told me that my book had changed his life. You know? And he, he, almost, he almost wrote me, had teary eyes listening to him. It, the grammatically worst letter I've ever written, mm. ever I read, but the most touching letter that I've ever received. You know? Yeah. And I received a lot of those. So I seen that whatever I had been saying, it was uh, it was taking hold in the in the cities, and so I decided just to up you know, to step it up, and uh, that's what I've been doing since. then. you know, I, I think that we have a responsibility as writers, authors, rappers, whatever it is. You know, we can entertain, but we also have to inform. That's know? right. That's right. You know, let's call it from a federal prison. I think that as a people, we have the luxury of just indulging, just pure entertainment. You know. It can be entertainment, but it should be also be informed. It should be instructed, you know. And we have to find a way to give a teachable moment in some of these stories. And, you know, I, I listened to Alicia Keys, uh, A Perfect Way to Die. You know, it's a beautiful song, you know, in terms of entertainment, but it is highly informative and highly instructive. Rise Up by Audrey Day, you know. Right, right. Um, you know, this, this is the kind of stuff that I think that we have a responsibility to do with our people, man. Because if we don't, you know, uh, the system as it stands now is an existential threat to black Americans. And if you're not trying to address this, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Absolutely. If you can't think past big enough about just going up to the club and throwing it up and making it rain, you know, like the guy say, I ain't on nothing. You ain't on nothing for real. On the real. On the real. If you're not, you're not dress, addressing uh, law enforcement and criminal justice or voter suppression. The sister down in Georgia, I forgot her name, that ran for governor. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Uh, her, her brain is, you know, my, my brain is jacked that's, up. That's, that's what I got a brain for. I, I, yeah, I, I got, a, got a picture in my head. <laughs> but those are my heroes, you know. No. Uh, cast, you well. know, by... Uh, Isabel Alexander. Yes. Those are my heroes. You okay. know, okay. those are the people that we should be enshrined and holding up. And if you're not addressing this, if you're not taking serious what's happening in this country in terms of systemic racism, and that this stuff really does pose an ex- existential threat to us, and you have kids or you have parents, you know, and they're going to be subjected to this, you know, when they when they all but trying to make Black Lives Matter a terrorist organization, and you just sitting on here and you still at the club. <laughs> You're part of the problem. That's on the real. That's on the real. Yeah, part of the problem. Man. So, you know, you got to like man up and step it up. You know? mm-hmm. We can't leave this to anybody else to solve this problem. We have to solve it our own, ourselves. Like they say, if not you, who? And if right. not now, then when? That's right. That's right. Brother, those are going to be my parting words, man. Stay up. I'm yeah. going to send you something personally to read, a, a book that I'm working on. Sounds you good. Send it to me a few days, man. Hey, uh, man. I'll send you a few chats. Well, we we here. Anyway, uh, that was Wayne Akbar, Wayne Pr- Wayne Akbar Prey. A um, lot of jewels in that convo. We uh we wanted to delve a little bit more into uh into some of the things he spoke on. Of course, he's calling us from a uh, federal penitentiary somewhere in the gulags of the United States. So we wanted to make sure that uh you know we 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 speak without uh without causing any issues for lack of better words. You know, we appreciate you all checking out Riot Starter TV. It's going to be more folks coming, calling in um, from all walks of life, freedom fighters, uh, you know, brothers and sisters who've been uh, out in the battlefield, 
you know, some who who came in the wrong way on the wrong side and and and, and gonna come out on the right side. You know, so we want you to stay tuned to not only Riot Starter TV, but Black Power Media as a whole. We have a, a, a plethora of dope shows that uh, you could check out, you know, but we wanted to definitely provide some, some alternatives and alternative programs because of the fact that oftentimes we have uh, the same old, same old. Sometimes we, we need to talk to brothers and sisters behind the wall. You know what I mean? So again, we appreciate you checking us out. Um, Riot Starter TV, Black Power Media. We out here. Peace.